Yeah, server the... monkey. Server monkey. <laughs> I want to give a shout out to them. Uh, they gave me a deal on a server. And uh, some people have asked about specking out servers and doing things for Zen and how do you spec out a server? Well, unless you have really high compute requirements, which for this task we don't, this is actually just going to run some of our virtual machines, which is pretty basic uh, requirements, which is our point of sale. It's all running on very low oh, spec this is ours? hardware. Yeah, this is ours. I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he thought it was going to a client. Oh, uh, that means we're replacing the virtual thing. Yes. Can I have that board? Yes. Uh, so this discussion has come up before of whether or not you run on consumer hardware or if you run on server hardware. Six one way, half a dozen the other? There, Yeah, there's some validity to both. Uh, consumer hardware has become way more reliable in the past years than it ever was before. Servers have also increased in reliability, but yes. they've always been even reliable. And the bottom line with this one was a server that would also house 10 gigabit. So this is yes. also not in this video, but the next video covering the details of the server will show how we're going to migrate Zen over 10 gigabit with iSCSI. And I'll put together a whole video on that, but that's what this The service. servers are nice when you need like uh, something like this for when you need higher RAM and processing power versus, you know, like a new Horizon build, you can get some of these for less than a new Ryzen build. Right, and the, um, thing, the Ryzen's are really nice, but yeah. they also are not on the compatibility list for Zen. So if you're yeah. looking for 100% compatibility, the Ryzen's have not made the list. Does I mean they won't make the list at, at the moment? Just not there yet, they They're just came out. Yet. This is a Dell server that is on the list, so we're gonna go unbox it and cover the details of this server and talk about it. Open it up. I'm opening it up. So we got the server on box. I got a box sitting under it, so it's kind of tilted so you can see here. And I'll do a few close-ups of what's in here. And what I wanted to talk about today is uh, the server, the specking it out, and you know the consumer hardware debate. So I have built servers on consumer hardware. And some people are like, no, it's going to die if you don't care about your data. The reality is if the budget does not allow for a, let's say, enterprise deployment, then you have to kind of fit with what the client's budget is. So as much as I would love to only sell super high-end equipment, I just, sometimes it doesn't fit the budget. We're in the small business market, not the enterprise market. And you can build reliable servers on essentially what you may call consumer grade hardware, which is you know the commodity stuff that you buy versus the enterprise hardware. Now we picked this server up for relatively inexpensive. This is an older Dell R710. Now. I, it's really neat that this server, as old as it is, uh, but because it has dual processors, rivals some of the processing power you can get for price per dollar, I mean. Obviously, it's not going to match a Threadripper, but you get a pretty impressive amount of performance out of these, and they're reasonably priced. I mean, this server, you can find this on servermonkey.com under $500, and they offer warranties on these. And what we have here is I've added more RAM to it, but as they shipped, it was 32 gigs of RAM, dual 2.9 Xeon processors. They're the X5670 models. So that means there is six cores in here, six cores in here, 12 cores between them, plus the virtual cores, because each core can be hyper-threaded to a virtual core. So now we have 24 cores of processing power. This actually puts it quite up there, I think around 12,000 if you're using CPU mark to kind of just give you, engage the raw processing power. That's not bad. That's a lot of processing power to be had for a complete server. Uh, the, the cheapest uh, Ryzen's even are going to be about more expensive than this to get it's close to the same level of compute power. Obviously, the Threadripper beats it out. Uh, the cheapest Threadripper beats it out, but the cheapest Threadripper costs more than its entire server that we had shipped to us, including the shipping. So. This is uh, our virtualization server that we're gonna be using for some more projects that we have and more videos that are coming because uh, we put 40 gigs of RAM total in here. To shift to 32, we had, like I said, eight more uh, laying around, so we have a total of 40 gigs. And the enterprise hardware is designed a lot different. You have a lot more modularness to it. So if I wanted to remove a fan, I can just simply pull the fan out and this fans can even be replaced live with the machine. Some of the newest enterprise hardware we've seen by Lenovo, they have a way without taking the lid off that you can replace it. They even have the whole motherboard on its own trays. And so does the uh, TrueNAS boxes when we're gonna review those. It's really neat when you start messing with enterprise hardware. They make it very modular, they make it very well designed to all work together, fit together, cable managed and everything else. And these servers come in different configurations. We have one that has eight 
two and a half inch. And the reason why, and I love that they come with these nice little press the button and they pop right out. And like the hard drives, we went with SSDs in here because this is only going to boot Zen server doesn't need a lot. So we have uh, just two 40 gig SSDs that provides enough small amount of local storage in case I do want to run a VM on it. Uh, for example, we're probably going to run Zen Orchestra on it just for management. So this can boot up, Zen Orchestra can boot up and we can see visibility in the machine. And then what we've added in here is a 10 gigabit controller with SFP plus. Now this is going to, uh, this is a controller we got from, I think you could say it Chelsea. Uh, Chelso. These are common controllers. These were like, I don't know, $40 on Amazon. I'll throw a link below so you can find it. And this gives me 10 gigabit connectivity to FreeNAS. These cards are both supported in Zen and in FreeNAS and they're just a standard PCI 8X slot. So there's nothing real special. And this old server has a slot that will handle it and recognizes the card. Now, like I said, the, if you're building enterprise hardware, you get some cool features. I'm going to show you some of the things that come built in on these. Uh, for example, the iDRAC, which is the management system that even while the server is not powered up as far as the motherboard running, but does have power to the power supply, it lets you see things like the wattage, it lets you see the fans and things like that. And what this offers is what they may refer to as like an out of band management. So if you have rows of servers in a data center, you know physically what server it is, but you don't have time to run to the data center, but you want to get into the settings and change something or see what's going on with the power supply or if there's been a failure. This is kind of like bypasses and has its own small operating system that operates on the first port of the ethernet and allows you to do that. So these, these are definitely an option when you're specking it out. Now this, like I said, may be real low for what your needs are, uh, but you can find used servers for pretty reasonable prices and some of them aren't that old. So you can get that. So if you don't, if you go, I got enough budget to buy something enterprise and my compute power needs are not super high, I, you can find these for very reasonable prices and you know still get your projects done. And this one here, I mean, it's not gonna break the bank if you're getting into and want to engineer your own lab. This is really cool because it's one single box. And now the nice thing about the R710 is the wattage consumption. And this system idles at about 172 watts. When you load up all 24 cores, I've seen it hit about 350 or so watts. That's not too bad. That's one of the things, if you go with some of the really old servers, one of the things we realized was some of them, you have to go look at the efficiency servers. As they got newer, got more efficient. Of course, the newer ones are more expensive, but that's a consideration depending on how much your power costs. So depending on where you live, we're lucky here in Michigan because our commercial power rates are actually really low. I think there was a chart and we were one of the lowest in the uh, continental US, but that becomes a concern because they also don't just use more power if they're using a lot of power they also produce a lot of heat. And if they're producing a lot of heat, you also have to figure out, unless it's cold outside, what to do with all that extra heat. So server room cooling, or if you have this in your bedroom because you're doing it as a project in your home lab, that is a consideration of how hot will it be in my room. And uh, we've seen that because you can pick up for, they actually have a little bit more power. You can find some of the four processor, four socketed processors. The downside is a lot of those older servers, they may rival this in speed, but they are substantially, when you have four giant Xeons that you're trying to cool, the thing just acts like a hair dryer sitting there blowing hot air. So it's one of those considerations when you're building these going, okay, I want to spec out a server. Now compatibility, I mentioned that the Threadrippers are not on the compatibility list. Now, what that basically means when you're when you're really specking things out is they you want things on the compatibility list if you're going, okay, I need absolutely nothing to ever have a problem, so you go with the most compatible. This being older has long since been on the compatibility list for things like Zen. You can actually go there on their uh, compatibility list and find it. I imagine it's on the compatibility list for ESXi and several other uh, hypervisors, so that's something really nice. I have, for example, I have a really old Optron board that we, I did my original Zen testing and what happened was it works great. It seems never to crash or have a problem, but it does have a problem if I reboot it. It just doesn't reboot. It just doesn't seem to, it starts the reboot process, it just stops and you have to power it off and power it back on. The parts in it are hodgepodge together. It's an older board uh, and I know it had some problems as far as because it's got two memory slots that just simply don't recognize anymore. So I know there's some weird issue with the board, but it's funny because sometimes those are things you may run into that may or may not get fixed when you're using some of the consumer hardware. It doesn't mean it won't work, but it becomes more of a trial and error versus I know that I load Zen on an R270 and it just works. 
So that's some of the back and forth you may have with it. And Dell and other large server manufacturers often work to build a machine that works exactly with something like ESX or Zen. They work to go, okay, we know the specs, we know that this is what this is gonna be used for, so they're so purpose designed. So the other nice thing about, like I said, the, once you go to the enterprise hardware, it does look really cool that besides that, but the, um, the ease of finding parts for a, a several, several year old server, if you choose one right, is actually really funny how inexpensive it is. These fans on eBay, I look, they're like $6. So if a fan goes out, a few bucks. Uh, the power supplies, it, the power supply for this and they're modular, it's a little tricky to get out. The modular power supply, and this has dual redundant ones as well. Uh, they're only, I think these are $29. I found them on uh, eBay, and I think new ones are on Amazon. They list it as uh, not used for something like 50 bucks. So you can actually get these for relatively cheap. Now, and one thing I will say for enterprise hardware, they don't use just any fans. The fans and everything are of high quality because when Dell designed this, they're pretty much expecting it to go into service and not be pulled out of service until it's just absolutely obsolete. And my friends who work in the enterprise world will tell you, I talked to a friend who works for a very large Fortune 500 company and he told me, you wouldn't believe just how many Windows 2000 servers we still have in use. And they're running on enterprise hardware. The servers have long since should have died, as he put it, but because they're not dying, and they still run and they're still sitting there and they still operate the thing they operate, even though they're out of cycle, out of life, way behind patched, so they got them hidden behind firewalls, no one wants to replace them. And these things just keep chugging away. You, that's part of the reason you can find so many of these pulled out of service from companies who are more forward thinking or have really high demands on compute power. You can find these for reasonably priced. Matter of fact, I've gotten lucky before and bought some uh, servers off Craigslist that still had warranty on them from Dell. They were being gotten rid of by a company that uh, they just have a real high churn and needed faster ones. And we actually bought all of them because we realized they had five year warranties. They were only two years into the warranty and they're replacing the servers. I don't know what logic got them to replace them, but we had we had acquired a bunch of high-end servers that we ended up deploying for a crazy great price. And we bought them directly from the company, so it wasn't really shady or anything. They just didn't need them anymore. So that's a look of the enterprise hardware. I'm gonna show you some of the iDRAC features next. I'll, I'll log into that, kind of give you an idea of what it looks like, which is really novel on these. And these are nice features you get when you go with the enterprise hardware. As far as like truly specking things out, I'm gonna cover that detail a little bit later here in the video uh, and talk about how you kind of calculate some of that. And that's oh, that's ma that's a little bit of magic. Uh, there's not always as easy of a way to do this, but I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. All right, so this is the integrated Dell remote access controller. And like I said, it's essentially a way to get into kind of like the BIOS or see what's going on in a system, even if it's not completely powered up. I mean, it has to have power for this to work, but you assign it an IP address and then you can see things inside of here. So we have the system overview. We have the iDirect settings here. So we can see the controller network settings, IPv4 if we needed to change something in there. Uh, create your users in here. We just have an anonymous uh, disabled and then the Thomas user enabled right now that I have uh, administrative rights over. But let's take a look at the fan, for example. Now it does not work super fast. This is a pretty basic integrated controller. It's like its own small operating system on, this, on there. But it tells you the system board fan, the RPMs. And I think this is kind of cool too, is it's got the temperature in here so you can see some of the history. Uh, intrusion, it will let you know if the chassis is open or closed so it can let you know or alert you if someone's inside of there. Uh, it'll sh do the power monitoring. And this is stuff that you you know can frequently see in a BIOS of a lot of boards, but it, this one gets a lot more detail because you have the statistics, average watt usages, and things like that. So right now it's showing an average power consumption of uh, 205. Here was where I powered it up and did some testing. It jumped up to 338 watts, and you can reset these statistics, but it, it's kind of nice because it gives you that level of detail inside of here uh, to be able to do that. Uh, you can also see the voltages so it can alert you if there's you know any of the v-core voltages for any of the cpus the board or the power suppliers having any problems and you know like i said it's just kind of novel uh, and it also gives you battery status 
So there is a battery because this, these have hardware RAID and the hardware RAID controllers use a battery to determine the settings and retain those settings, not just because it's not saved into a system BIOS chip, it's separate on a separate card. So you have a system board battery, which is actually your standard coin battery you see on most motherboards. And then you have a storage battery, which is actually a larger uh, brick on them, which is kind of novel. All right, so let's actually talk a little bit about the system speed, and then we'll get into about specking out the hardware. So here's the Windows 10 machine that's inside of here. I have some processors assigned to it, and I actually like, created a virtual machine on here. It's actually pretty snappy, but the console on this eh, is kind of mediocre, so I like to use RDP because it just works a lot faster than trying to do everything inside of this little console. And I'll show you, I already have the results of the test, which are right here. And you can see the CPU mark score of 11,082. That's while running virtualized. So it's not horrible. It says I'm in the 91% percentile. And for as old as this server is, I think it's almost like seven or eight years old, that horrible. And this is obviously running virtual, which has its own overhead. So it's not running raw on the hardware. Uh, and I also opened up Photoshop and was just playing around with things inside of here. It, it's snappy, very usable, and uh, for the age of the machine and running virtual, that works really well. Now, when it comes to some of the specs for us, we are uh, just going to be running a bunch of PFSense instances. And PFSense doesn't have, even for routing uh, at a high speed, does not have really high-end requirements. If you actually look at the processors that PFSense is using, not a whole lot. The other Linux servers that we have as well, like our point of sale and our wiki server, even our screen connect server handles our remote connections. You're talking like a gig of RAM and a low uh, processor. So something like this for our compute power becomes really reasonable like it just does not take a lot of horsepower to run a lot of the things that we have or the linux servers that we're deploying and this is the case for a lot of special use things we have uh, we have some clients that are using uh, zen with some older servers like this and one of them is actually running uh, for years has been running on one of these r710s because also this is a basic inventory management system written in mysql that takes a series of things and these things do not have high compute power therefore we just need a good reliable server for them make sure we have plenty of backups and that's one nice thing about when you virtualize it, we back up the entire virtual machine, put it onto a file and, you know, have a copy of it. So we're really solid on those, but it just doesn't have a lot of high-end requirements. But what if you do? Let's talk about that. So here's servermonkey.com, and this is where we bought the server from. They actually have some good deals on a lot of different servers if you're looking used um, and want something that's got some performance, but you don't want to break the bank on it. They do a lot of Dell and HP servers, and these, these are pretty nice. And you can get them shipped with you with the 10 gigabit NIC and things like that. Now, calculating what your requirements are becomes sometimes even a debate between you and the vendor. Uh, we had a vendor that we just felt was slightly under specking what they wanted to tell. They're like, oh, our computer requirements are really, really low. Their program was a little bigger than they said, and we really looked at it, and uh, it was kind of a pain. Other clients we've had where we can't believe what the server requirements are, but a lot of times you start that process by going, what is, you know, for example, the database system that runs a carpet store, you wouldn't think needs to be that big. They were having all kinds of problems. We're still in debate about them, but I think it's because the software is horribly coded is most of my opinion on that. Uh, but their database is five gigs running in SQL, and it really, really grinds a lot just to look up a customer. And uh, they were like, what are you, you know, going to do? So we ended up upgrading this server to something with really high, you know, it's a really nice RAID array uh, built for performance. RAID 10 was kind of the solution. Because I'm like, why is the database so big? The company goes, that's how it is. So it's going back and forth to them. So determining that is not always the easiest or most fluid way. The other thing that can be a little tricky is when you look at, uh, if you Google RDS sizing capacity planning guide, and right here's one from Microsoft who maybe I'm just missing something, but here's their one, and it's a seven-year-old guide. So I don't understand. There's newer, if you just Google search it some more, you can find some other people in good discussions if you're doing a bunch of remote users and some solutions to that. And I've seen this one, was marked, some of these are marked as solved and how much specs you need to go on there. And it's funny because here's a newer, even the newer posts, oh, go back and Microsoft apparently deleted this one. Uh, but there's a lot of people referencing some of these older articles. So it can be a little bit tricky. I generally recommend as much as you can go over because these 
are once you put a server in, they generally are going to be out there for quite a number of years, um, unless they're going cloud compute. And this is kind of the advantage of cloud compute. We can just elastically, as they say it, do it as needed. So you can say, okay, let's just make this bigger, no problem. Add a little more compute time, no problem. Uh, but that gets out of hand occasionally as well. One of my friends, his project has literally saved his company a fortune because they had spun up so many things in Amazon, they ended up overpaying because they just to say, hey, why not spin up another instance? And the previous IT people spun up so many that they were spending just an absurd amount of money. He's cut their Amazon bill by 40% just by going, why do we have everything set to this? So that can be kind of another tricky part. Uh, but like I said, I, I almost want to say there's not an absolute guide. I don't know anyone I've ever met who says, this is exactly how you do it, even when you get on the phone and talk back and forth with the Dell people. So the best thing is if you can reach out to people who are running the same compute platform or the same tools that you have, say they're going to run the same thing, find out what they're using. Uh, with the carpet company, we were kind of shocked at what they wanted us wanted to do. And we had the same thing with the database company for one of our transportation clients because they wanted a uh, really high-end spec for just a warehousing software. Um, so we built it and you know it, it works great. It's actually really fast, but it was kind of a wow. And so was the customer because they ended up spending $11,000 in hardware to run a database that manages their warehouse. I mean, that's expensive. The, the contract there for the warehouse is lucrative for them. So they understood they had to pay it. I know the warehousing software was also expensive. Uh, they just were kind of shocked that overall they spent, you know, it was a 30 something thousand dollar project for them, it turned out, uh, just to get a management program to uh, manage and do this. And But you can kind of see it was going back and forth. Sometimes the requirements are lower or higher. You got to really work with the vendors to truly spec that out. But the, um, servermonkey.com like they're one of the popular ones there and they have some of these Dell's uh you know 7310 730s uh the reason we price and you can customize these and build them from there and you know build your own lab if you want if you're just looking for something basic or you just have like we do we don't have really high demand compute power uh, it doesn't take a high end processor to run all the different linux virtual machines that we have nature of them they're just not not that intense. We have 6,000 clients in our database, but uh, it, I can do a database query in under a second on some older spec hardware because everything's written really, really efficient. I will tell you some of these things written on top of SQL and Windows, not efficient, are not well coded, and they have high compute time. They need a lot of horsepower to make up for sloppy coding. So that is something you may run into when you're trying to spec out servers for your customers. So if you like to kind of hear, like, subscribe, hopefully this guide was somewhat helpful talking a little bit about this and kind of give you an idea of some of the enterprise versus uh, consumer hardware and, you know, a, a, a look at what you get. Of course, as you get to the newer servers, they are amazing and they have all kinds of even more cool features. So once again, if you like to content here, like and subscribe. See you guys next time.